Hey everyone, my name is Forrest with Rocky Mountain School of Photography and today we're gonna take a look at the GoPro Hero 10 Black and do our ultimate setup guide. Let's go ahead and dive in. Before we take a look at the camera, I need to get a few things out of the way. Number one, this is gonna be primarily focused on video settings. This video would just be insanely long if I was gonna tackle video, photo, and time-lapse settings. So, I'll be making future videos on the best photo settings and the best time-lapse settings, but this specific video is gonna focus on video. Second thing, this is not a quick tips guide. We are gonna dive deep on these settings. We're gonna talk about what things do, how they actually work. And I'm not just gonna say, set your camera like this and you'll have the best footage. I'm gonna explain to you how this camera works, help you understand it, and help you make an informed decision on which settings you should use for your situation. Number three, there's a certain amount of background information that you're gonna to need to know, and I'm gonna do my best to bring you up to speed on those things, but do understand that I'm gonna be referencing other videos throughout this one. I've linked them all in the description, by the way, and it might be good to watch those background information videos if you're truly looking to understand this camera. Finally, it must be said that I am not an action sports athlete, nor am I using this camera to record super adventurous things. I'm a pretty average dude who uses my camera to record pretty average dude footage. So if you are like a pro skier and you wanna know the best settings to like bomb off a cliff and do some super sick thing with skiing, definitely watch another video. This isn't really for you, but if you're an average person who wants to use a GoPro to capture some great footage, which you can definitely do, this is definitely the place for you. Sit back, relax, let's go ahead and take a look at this camera. In order to make this setup guide easier to navigate, I've broken it up into chapters down at the bottom of the screen. You can also access those in the description. I'm breaking this video up into a few main parts. We're gonna start with talking about the general purpose settings for a GoPro camera. Then we're gonna get into the video main settings like resolution and frame rate. And finally, we're gonna get into the ProTune options, which is where you really start to be able to customize what the camera does and unlock the most potential out of it. Lastly, we're gonna conclude with some final thoughts. Long story short, check out the links down in the description or the chapters down at the bottom to skip ahead to different sections. Let's go ahead and start with general setup. There are a few things in the general GoPro menu that I think are important to talk about. I'm also gonna assume that we've already turned on our camera, downloaded the update, and synced it with the GoPro Quick app, because you're actually not able to use this camera out of the box without doing that. So make sure you download the Quick app on your smartphone, you'd power up the GoPro, link the two of them, and get that update installed. Once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and power on the camera. And in order to get to the general purpose settings, what I'm gonna do is swipe down from the top of the screen. And immediately we're granted with eight quick access buttons. And these are important to understand. The first of these is voice control. We can turn this on and turn this off. And what this enables our camera to do is listen to us. So we could use commands like GoPro record or GoPro stop recording. This can be super useful if your camera is located in a position where it's difficult to push the shutter button. I will warn you though, I have found in my experience that there are a lot of missed recordings and missed record stoppings. Basically the camera records when I don't want it to. So I leave this off unless I'm in a situation where I need to control my camera with my voice. The second control is the beep. You can hear that turning on and off. I'm gonna leave the beep off for the purposes of this video, but let it be known that normally on my camera, I turn the beep on because I find it way easier to get a little bit of auditory feedback when my camera recognizes me pressing something. The third option is something called quick capture. It's this little rabbit right here. We can turn quick capture on or quick capture off. With quick capture off, in order to take a recording, you need to first power on the camera and then push the shutter button to take a video clip. With quick capture on, all you need to do from the camera being off is just push the shutter button. The camera will turn on as quickly as possible and start in a recording immediately upon powering on. This can be a great way to reduce the amount of time it takes to start recording something very, very slightly. It's not gonna be a huge advantage, but it'll definitely help. I will say, this means that now two buttons will turn on your camera. So if you're worried about your camera turning on in your camera bag, it might be good to turn that off so that only the power button will power up the camera. Button number four is simply a screen lock. We can lock the screen or unlock it. Useful if you're gonna use your camera underwater. Sometimes cameras when they're underwater will register false touches. 
and you'll start changing settings just by having the camera underwater. I'm gonna leave that off unless I'm in a situation that I want that. Finally, setting number five is grid. This turns on an overlaid three by three grid, which can help you compose your shots. Those of you who know something about photography or video, you might have heard of the rule of thirds and using rule of thirds for composition. This can be a great way to help visualize that composition as well as keep your horizons level when you're shooting. Setting number six is what the front screen does. You can see if we tap that setting right there, we have four options, front screen off, front screen records the status, front screen shows the actual screen, or front screen shows the full screen. GoPro Hero 10 has a front screen. It's one of the best features. It means when you're doing a vlog style video, you can very quickly and easily see what you look like without having to record and then turn the camera around and something like that. It's awesome. And we can decide what the front screen does. I prefer my front screen to be on actual screen view. What this does is it on the front screen, it shows me exactly what I'm recording without any cropping taking effect. My video will be a little bit smaller on the front screen because the front screen is square and my video is wide angle, but I prefer to see my actual composition. If you wanna see yourself a little bit larger, you can put it on this fourth option, which will zoom in, basically fill the front screen with what it's recording. However, it's gonna clip off the sides. It's all a matter of what you would prefer. For me personally, I like the nice widescreen and seeing exactly what I'm recording. Setting number seven is orientation lock. The GoPro actually has an accelerometer in it, which means if you rotate it upside down or vertical, it will record footage in that orientation. What we can do is rotate the camera to the orientation we're trying to use. For example, maybe you're mounting your camera upside down on a GoPro mount. So you got a GoPro mount stuck to maybe the visor of your truck or your car, and you wanna flip the camera over and you want the footage to look right side up when you record it. We can use rotation lock to lock it in whichever orientation we're in before we push that button. Again, rare instances that I'm gonna use that, but that is here and super easy. The eighth and final button is simply the max lens adapter. And you'll notice as soon as I tap it at the time of this recording, it tells us that we need an update. They haven't actually released the software for GoPro to work with the max lens mod. In fact, let me show you the max lens mod. I'll be back in a second. All right, I'm back. We're gonna have a video coming out about this in the future, but the max lens mod is super cute. It's a little tiny lens that we can put on the front of our camera and it basically makes our field of view much wider than it would be normally. And this gives us a lot of cool advantages like better stabilization, better horizon leveling, all kinds of stuff. So we'll have a video on this coming, but as of right now, I can't use this with my Hero 10 because they haven't issued the software update. So those are our first eight quick buttons. To get to more settings, we can swipe right, I guess that's left, swipe left, and we can get into the connection settings and the camera preferences. Connections is simply where we manage the GoPro's connections to other devices, like your phone. Really straightforward, I very rarely go into there after the initial setup of getting my camera connected to my phone. The preferences though, there are some useful things in here, or namely one useful thing. I've seen a lot of people have trouble with memory cards and losing data. Being a teacher here at Rocky Mountain School of Photography, we have tons of students coming through our school every year learning with us. And while they're here, inevitably we have a couple students every year get a corrupted memory card. I've got an SD card right here. Here's a little example. This is full size SD, not micro SD like a GoPro would use. But these SD cards are pretty delicate and they can, if not treated properly, corrupt your data. So you imagine you're going on some once in a lifetime trip to Hawaii and you bring your GoPro with you and you get this amazing footage of you snorkeling and once in a lifetime trip, right? Super amazing. The problem is you haven't treated your SD card properly. And when you go to import that footage from your trip, you plug in your card and sometimes the computer just says it can't find any files. And that's a real big bummer. And sometimes there's not a way to recover that information. So if you're gonna take one thing from this video, it would be one great thing you can do to treat your memory cards properly. And that is formatting them. Now, before we get into how to format, I need to give a very important disclaimer. Formatting your memory card erases all of the data. So this is something you should do once all the footage is off the card and safely backed up on your computer. As soon as we hit the button, the data is gone. So definitely understand that before proceeding with these steps. To format the card, we can go into preferences. 
scroll down to the very bottom and tap the reset button. And inside of reset, there's a button that says format SD card. And it even warns us here, delete all files and reformat your SD card. We're aware of that. I just told you that would happen. So I'm going to hit format and we can see once I tap that, it's going to take a second, format the card and we will be left with an empty card. Now, formatting doesn't just erase all of your data. It also reformats the card to work very well with this specific camera. So I'm in the habit of any time I put a new card into my GoPro, the first thing I do is format it. Even if the card's already empty and I've been using it in another camera, say my drone, I still take the card out, pop it in the GoPro, format it first thing. It's not gonna be foolproof. You might still get corrupted data down the line due to some other cause, but this is definitely definitely a great way to prevent future card issues from happening, especially with footage that's going to be, you know, of utmost importance to keep safe. On that note, getting a good system for backing up your footage and getting a good system for uploading your footage to the GoPro cloud, they now discount the cameras a ton if you subscribe to GoPro Plus, can be a great way to keep your footage safe. All right, enough about formatting. I will say there are some other preferences in here that can be useful. Some mod setup stuff, some general stuff like time and how long it takes it to power off, on and on and on. For the most part though, I'm really only going into this menu, the preferences, to format my card. With all that said, I think it's time to dive into our video settings. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swipe up here, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back, and I'm gonna get back into the camera view. We can swipe out of preferences there. Now, the way GoPro works is if you swipe left or swipe right, you're going to put yourself in a certain mode. And like I said, the camera has three modes. There's a photo mode, there's a video mode, and there's a time-lapse mode. We're gonna make other videos on the best settings for photo and for time-lapse, but today we're gonna to focus on video. So let me go ahead and swipe over and select video mode. Now for our video settings, there's a couple things we need to talk about. We're gonna start with the general purpose settings and then we're gonna get into what GoPro calls the ProTune settings. So let's start with the general purpose settings. To get into those, we're gonna tap this bottom button down here and we're gonna get into what GoPro calls their presets. And you can see they give us a few of these presets that they have said are best for standard video, activity, and cinematic understand that these are all customizable. So what GoPro calls standard might be very different than what you wanna use as your standard preview. Uh, it's just a name, right? It's just a setting, a group of settings, a name, a preset, whatever you wanna call it. And we're probably gonna to wanna to customize that to work best for us. So I'm gonna tap standard and I'm gonna hit the little pencil next to this little preset and that's gonna let me edit it. And now I've got these first, what is that? Six, seven, eight, eight settings that we need to talk about. Like I said, if we keep scrolling down, those are the ProTune settings. We're gonna talk about those later in the video. For now, let's focus on these upper areas. In order to fully understand these upper settings, the number one thing that we're setting up here is a resolution and a frame rate. And I think that's the most important thing to understand. I said, if you get one thing out of this video, it's understanding to format your cards. I would say if you get two things out of the video, the next thing I'd really want you guys to leave with is fully understanding what resolution is and what frame rate is and when to choose different options. So let's break it down. Let's start with resolution. Whether you knew it or not, videos are actually made up of many still images all put together in a row. And the resolution is the size measured in pixels of those still images that go into our video. Long story short, the higher resolution, you guys have all probably heard HD, right? High definition or high resolution. The higher your resolution, the more pixels you have on your video footage. And you might say, what's a pixel? Well, a pixel is a little square light and what's the takeaway? The takeaway is the higher your resolution, the sharper and crisper your footage is gonna look. A byproduct of that is shooting a higher resolution gives you the ability to crop your footage more in post-production. A quick example of this is GoPros have very wide angle lenses, right? They show a lot in the field of view. You can see like almost 180 degrees of what's in front of you. They're made for those up close and personal action sequences. Well, if your camera is always shooting wide angle, but you shoot a very high resolution, you can actually crop in or punch in as it's known in the industry, punch into that video, crop into that video, and still be left with a pretty good looking crisp image. 
the lower resolution you shoot, the more blurry, not as crisp, fewer pixels you're gonna have, which means you're gonna have less ability to crop as well. Some common resolutions we talk about are 1080p, 2.7K, 4K, and 5.3K. The takeaway is the higher the number, the better things are gonna be. Also, 1080p is almost 1K, basically. So you really have 1K, 2.7K, 4K, and 5.3K. And the more Ks means more pixels, which means sharper, which also means, if you want to, more ability to punch in in post-production. So let's go ahead and take a look at those settings. Again, if I go into my editing, the very first thing that I have when I go to edit a preset is RES-FPS, which is resolution and frames per second. If we tap on that, we can see our resolutions across the top here. We've got 5.3K, 4K, 2.7K, and 1080, which is basically 1K. I can tap on any of these, and I'm able to very quickly and easily change my resolutions. Now, I also wanna point out that there are some four by three aspect ratio resolutions up above. A, 5 point, a 5K 4 by three, a 4K 4 by three, and a 2.7K 4 by three. 4 by 3 is a different aspect ratio, which means it's a little bit of a more square format, it's a square looking video, than the super wide 16 by 9, which we're all used to. Just for that you guys can see it, the video you're watching of me right now is 16 by 9. And if I wanted to, I could shoot this in 4 point, uh, sorry, not 4.3, in 4 by 3. Let's go ahead and do that right now. This is 4 by 3. We're cropping off the edges, it's a more square format video. I recommend if you're just getting started with the GoPro, you stick to this bottom row um, or second row of resolutions, which are 16 by nine, which is what TVs are and what we're kind of all used to seeing. So 5.3K is the highest, crispest, most beautiful, sharp resolution. Gives us the most ability to crop, gives us the most pixels, makes everything look good. 1080p is the lowest, it's kind of potato quality. It doesn't look super good. You can't crop very much, if at all, if you want the footage to still look good. But there are some advantages of using a lower resolution. So let's get into that. We know why to use high resolution, but there are two distinct reasons I can think to use lower resolutions. Number one is how much footage you can fit on your memory card. If you don't own a lot of memory cards and you wanna shoot all day long, say you're going on a, um, a motorcycle trip, and you're gonna motorcycle for five hours across the country, you're gonna have your GoPro recording that entire time. And unless you have a gargantuan sized memory card, you might wanna lower your resolution a little bit to reduce the amount of data that's getting written down to that card. Also, if you have an older computer or an older phone that might struggle with those large video files, you might wanna opt for a lower resolution as well. The second advantage of a lower resolution is that you can get a faster frame rate, which brings us into the frame rate discussion. And this is where it's kind of a sliding scale. The higher our resolution, the lower our frame rate needs to be. The lower our resolution, the higher our frame rate can be. So they move on opposites of one another. And there are situations where you're gonna want a faster frame rate at the expense of a lower resolution and the opposite. So frame rate is simply, we talked about video being made up of still images. Your frame rate is how many of those still images go into every second of video footage. That's why we call it frames per second or FPS, frame rate, frames per second, however you wanna to refer to it. The more frames per second you shoot means the more still images are recorded by the camera per second. And the advantages of this are that it allows you to do slow motion. And this gets a little bit opposite to what we might think. The faster our frame rate, meaning more frames per second, gives us the ability to do slower motion, slow our footage down more. As an example, if we shoot some footage at 240 frames per second, we could run that footage back, play it back in our editing program at one-tenth real speed. So you record a skateboarder doing a kickflip at 240 frames per second. You can play that footage back in your editing program at one-tenth speed, meaning you'll watch the kickflip happen 10 times slower than it actually happened. And that is super cool for times where there are a lot of action. So the higher the frame rate, the more ability we have to slow down our footage in post-production. 
Other than that, there are some other notable advantages and disadvantages of higher frame rates, but the takeaway is the higher the frame rate, the more ability for slow motion you can have. So how do we make sense of all of this? I'm gonna give you really a couple recommendations. My first recommendation is these days, I would not recommend a resolution lower than 2.7K. So I'm gonna almost say record one of two or three ways. I'm gonna go into resolution and frame rate. The lowest resolution I would use would be 2.7K. And the only reason I would use this resolution is if I had a need for 240 frames per second, because we can get that super fast frame rate at 2.7K. This is useful if you're shooting something that is moving very quickly, and more importantly, that you want to slow down. You are, you're seeing the shot, you're maybe you're surfing and you, you're like gonna hit a sweet like surf wave, I don't know surfing terms, you're gonna hit like a wave when you're surfing, and you wanna be able to slow it down to see what it looks like. This would be a great time for that. We're still getting the resolution of 2.7K, but 240 frames per second is gonna allow for that one-tenth speed we talked about. On the other hand, say you're just shooting some simple stuff like a YouTube video. Maybe you wanna use your GoPro for YouTube. I would go 5.3K, the highest resolution, and I would shoot at 30 frames per second, which is a pretty low frame rate. And that makes things look pretty nice. 5.3K at 30 frames per second is a pretty traditional frame rate. You'll have no ability to do slow-mo. You can't slow it down. If you try to slow down the footage, it'll look jittery, it'll look bad because it's not enough frames per second, but you get that super high resolution. And then a middle ground would be something like 4K at 120, which would be a higher resolution than 2.7K, but a lower frame rate. So those are kind of how I would summarize that. 5.3K at 30, 4K at 120, or 2.7K at 240. It's all a matter of how much slow motion are you planning on doing. I use the example of motorcycling across the country. You're probably not gonna wanna slow-mo your motorcycle trip that much. So in that case, I would choose the highest resolution, 5.3K, at a nice frame rate like 30 frames per second. Surfing, 100%, 2.7K at 240, because you're gonna wanna slow that stuff down. All right, that is resolution and frame rate. From there in these settings, we have a couple other things that are important. Lens is simply what field of view we want to use. Now, a lot of people think the GoPro might have a zoom lens. It's actually not true. The GoPro is always a wide angle lens. Um, so changing this doesn't magically zoom in the lens. It will digitally zoom, meaning it will crop, but you could also do the same thing in post-production. My recommendation here, if you're an advanced shooter and you're someone who's gonna use something like Adobe Premiere Pro for your editing or something like that, I would always shoot on wide and do any sort of cropping or zoom in post-production. I would also recommend shooting at a very high frame rate, or sorry, high resolution like 5.3K if you plan on cropping quite a bit in post-production. Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier. I will say though, that if you are not planning on doing some editing, I also wanna point out the linear option or linear plus horizon leveling, mostly linear though. Linear is gonna make your GoPro footage look not fisheye. No longer are you gonna have the bowed edges. Things are gonna be straight up and down. It's gonna make it look like a traditional camera. If you are someone who's not gonna do a lot of post-production and a lot of editing, I would be switching between wide and linear depending on the look and the feel I want for my footage. Linear plus horizon leveling actually makes the camera keep the horizon completely level. If you're doing like mountain biking and you're turning left and right, the horizon will actually stay right in the middle. It's kind of a cool effect. I mentioned the Max Lens Mod earlier and I showed it to you guys. Here's this little case, by the way, it's so cute. Um, I mentioned the max lens mod. With the max lens mod on, you could even turn the camera around to full 360 and it will still keep the horizon level. So pro people, I would go wide and crop and post or use a preset from uh, GoPro in Premiere to correct the fisheye effect. But if you are just starting out, you don't wanna really get into like advanced editing. I think swip, swapping between wide, linear, and linear plus horizon level makes sense. Next thing I wanna talk about is HyperSmooth. HyperSmooth is GoPro's stabilization, and it's awesome. Normally I would leave this on high. You can put this up to boost, but it will crop your footage a little bit. So basically if you're gonna do something that involves a lot of shake of the camera, you might wanna boost your HyperSmooth for those shots. 
but normally I would leave it on high. Very rarely would I turn it off because hyper smooth is absolutely amazing. It means that we don't need gimbals, we don't need stabilization. The camera stabilizes everything for us. So I'm gonna leave mine on high and that's where I leave it most of the time. Scheduled capture is a way that we can tell our camera to turn on at a preset amount of time and start recording for us. It's kind of cool if you want to go to sleep and tell your camera to turn on at 2 a.m. and shoot the stars, you can do that. Our duration is how long we want it to record for. So we can actually tell the camera to record for 15 minutes or two hours, so on and so forth. And if you combine scheduled capture with duration, you're able to tell your camera to turn on at a certain time, it wakes up, it shoots for a certain amount of time, and then it turns off. All battery power dependent, obviously. If your camera runs out of battery, it's not gonna keep shooting. Hindsight is an interesting feature if you are someone who does not know when the action is going to happen. The best way I can think about this is say that you're shooting a sporting event and you are, say you're shooting a mountain bike race and you are down a little bit from the jump. And so you have no idea when the racers are gonna come over the jump until they're already in the air over your head and maybe there's only 10 riders who are gonna come by, it's gonna be really hard for you to time it right, meaning you, you hear the crowd cheering up above, you're like, oh, they're coming, you hit the button and you try to guess it. Well, hindsight might be a great thing to turn on. We can turn on hindsight of 15 seconds or 30 seconds, and what this means is the GoPro will actually be always recording, all the time. If it's on, it's recording. It will only save the recording if you push the button. And if you've got it on 15 seconds, it will save the previous 15 seconds of footage plus anything after you record, after you push the button. 30 seconds, it'll pre-record, it'll save, excuse me, the previous 30 seconds plus anything you record after you push the button. This means with hindsight on, that mountain biker could go off that jump and you're like, oh, there they are, push the button. The camera saves the previous 15 seconds before the rider went off the jump and continues to record until you hit the button. It's a very cool feature, but it reduces your battery life considerably. So it's not something you wanna leave on all the time. Finally, we have timer. This is basically a self timer of either three seconds or 10 seconds. This is useful for those group shots, right? If you wanna like push the button and then run into the group. Um, this is much more of a photo feature than a video feature, but it's a great way if you're setting up the camera and you wanna go get in there with the group of people you're photographing or videoing, put on a 10 second self timer, run out there and be in the shot. Every camera's got this. Lastly is zoom. This is entirely digital zoom. Again, it's just like lens, except instead of changing it from fisheye to linear, all it's gonna do is digitally zoom in under your image. I recommend you leave zoom at 1x all the time and do all of your zooming in the GoPro app because you can't zoom out later if you want to. You can't go wider. So if you record everything with fully zoomed in at whatever resolution it allows you to, and different resolutions allow you to zoom in different amounts, it's never a way to go back. So I like to record everything as wide as I can and do my zooming or cropping in post-production. You all, those are our general setup buttons. That's what we have to worry about for general setup. Again, of the two things I've said in this video that I think are the most important, it's fully understanding resolution and frame rate and fully understanding that formatting a memory card is a super important thing to do. Next, we're gonna get into the ProTune settings, and this is where things get a little bit crazy. Those of you who have very little camera experience or video experience, you might wanna just stop now. Start using your GoPro with what we've talked about. But if you wanna unlock the very best that your GoPro has to offer, keep watching, because that's what we're gonna get into right now. Oh, this is a nourishing bowl of soup, take one. <laughs> I was just laughing with Jeff. He, uh, you guys have seen him in some other videos, but uh, I'd never have to stop in the middle of a video to have a nourishing bowl of soup. But when it's GoPro setup video time, I do, because holy cow, these videos are long. Um, I hope you guys are still with me. If you are, drop a like on the video. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm gonna eat some soup and then we'll get back into the ProTune settings. All right, to get to our ProTune settings, what we're gonna do is tap the preset at the bottom. We're gonna go to the little pencil and we're gonna scroll down uh, through those first eight that we talked about. And in here, we've got a lot of settings. Now, some of these I'm gonna glaze over is not super important. Other ones we're gonna spend a little bit more time on. The first one is bit rate. Bit rate is very straightforward. It's basically how good do you want your footage to look? By default, the camera's on standard. 
we have the option to put it up to high. Now, what's the downside? Obviously, there's got to be a downside because there'd only be one option. Well, with a high bit rate at whatever frame rate and resolution we're talking about, and again, frame rate and resolution we've already set. So this is given the frame rate and resolution, what bit rate do we want to use? The higher the bit rate, the better the footage will look, but the more space it will take up on your card. I'm, a recommend, I'm gonna recommend that you always use the high bit rate, and if you wanna save space on your card, buy bigger cards or reduce your resolution. That's a much more better, much more better, great grammar. That's a much better solution than reducing your bit rate. Bit rate is a direct uh, kind of byproduct of good quality video, and so the higher we can get our bit rate, the better things are gonna look. The next one here is shutter speed, and we can see I can select this shutter speed and I can lock my camera at a certain shutter speed. Now this one is very, very simple. I'm gonna recommend that you watch my video about using neutral density filters to fully explain this. But essentially, here's the answer. If you don't wanna deal with carrying around little filters, here are some neutral density filters and they just look like little kind of dark filters that we put in front. If you don't wanna worry about using neutral density filters and buying neutral density filters, leave your shutter on auto. With that said, if you want the best quality out of your GoPro, you can invest in some ND filters, but just understand that with ND filters also comes the need to understand shutter speed. So I'm gonna leave those both for my other video. Definitely go check that out, it's down in the description. I'll also put a card up in the corner. EV Comp is a useful one as well. This stands for exposure value compensation, and it's basically a way to override what the camera thinks is correct when it comes to bright and dark. A great example of this is, say you're recording on one of those gray sky days with a nice bright gray sky, and you're shooting some footage of you backlit against that sky. Your camera is gonna have a tendency to make you too dark because it's trying to correct for the bright sky behind you. And so what you can do with EV Comp is look through the camera, right? Obviously point the camera at your subject and notice is your subject a little bit too bright or a little bit too dark? And you can adjust the EV Comp up or down to compensate for that. It's basically like giving you manual control over what your footage looks like. I can tell you in a lot of situations, I'm putting my EV comp at plus one to compensate for the bright sky behind me when I'm recording. Again, that's my personal preference, but it's real easy. You can just look at the camera, hold it up, point it at the subject, and adjust the EV comp as needed. White balance is an important one as well. White balance is a way that the camera controls how warm or cool your video footage is. You might say warm or cool, what's that mean? Well, let me do it right now for you guys. Here's warm video footage and here's cool video footage. You can see I go from warm, which is like your reddish orange, to cool, which is blue. And the thing is, every color of light out there in the world has a certain color cast to it. So as an example, when you shoot on a bright sunny day, that has a warmer light cast to it than when you shoot on a cloudy day. Adjusting your white balance is telling your camera how to compensate for the color of light you're shooting under you'll notice that the default is auto, and auto does a good job in a lot of situations. But the problem is auto will change your white balance, meaning the warmth or coolness in your footage, midway through the recording. So if you're you know, bombing down a hill on a mountain bike and you go from a shady area to a sunny area, the camera's gonna be changing the white balance as you do that, which can sometimes look strange. So I recommend, if you have the time, look through the camera, drag your white balance down and up and find a white balance that looks good in the situation you're shooting in. You'll eventually get better at this and you'll start to learn certain white balances look good in certain lighting conditions. I will say though that again, if you're just getting started, shooting on the native or auto white balance can be the best. The other thing I wanna say is if you are planning on editing your footage in post-production, shooting at the native white balance can be a great way to ensure and give you the most edit ability down the line. So for me, as a more advanced shooter, I leave my white balance on native most of the time, or I will set it for the scene. If I was just getting started though, I would leave it on auto all the time and let the camera make the decision for me. The next is ISO min and ISO max. ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. And this is basically setting a endpoint, a constraint for how high the camera will push the ISO and how low the camera will push the ISO. 
This again is one of those ones where you're gonna want to kind of combine adjusting the ISO min and ISO max with something like using neutral density filters. I wouldn't just start messing with ISO min and ISO max. In fact, on my camera, I'm actually gonna expand my ISO max so that it can go all the way up to 6400. So I'm gonna say minimum is 100, but let it go as high as it needs to go. With the clear exception, if I'm going to get advanced with my camera and I'm going to start adjusting my shutter speed manually and I'm going to start using ND filters and I'm going to start using my ISO to my advantage, I might start reducing my ISO max in certain situations. And again, you guys should check out my ND filter video for more on that topic. It's too much to get into in this video because it does require buying some extra equipment. To summarize, if you're not gonna get into ND filters and go watch the other thing, set the ISO min to 100 and the max to the maximum of 6400. All right, next is sharpness. Very, very simple. I would leave this on medium if you're not gonna do any edits in post-production. I would leave this on low if you do plan on editing in post. I leave mine on low all the time and then I add my sharpening to taste when I'm editing my footage on my phone, my iPad, or my computer. I would never recommend high because it actually over sharpens in a lot of cases. Sharpness is not actually as it sounds. It's not sharpening your footage. It's adding sharpening. It's, it's a digital addition to your footage that makes it look sharper. The footage still isn't actually sharper. It just appears sharper. And so I like to do it very precisely and not have just three options of low, medium, and high. So for me, I leave mine on low all the time and add additional sharpening to taste. For you, I would recommend go medium. If you're not an advanced shooter, I would very rarely go to high. Another one of those editing ones, the color. If you want the best footage that you can then edit out of your GoPro, I would use the flat color profile. A lot of you have probably heard of flat log or log footage or things like that if you're a more advanced shooter. Shooting your GoPro in flat mode is gonna basically shoot very muted colors out of the camera. Basically the footage right out of the camera is gonna look pretty bad, but that bad footage is gonna be easier to edit once we get it into an editing program. On the other hand, if you're a more basic shooter and you want the best video footage straight out of the camera without doing any edits, I would recommend natural or vibrant. Vibrant's gonna give you more intense colors, so if you're gonna be in an area where there's a lot of colorful things, you might want that extra bit of vibrancy, and it's just gonna make your colors pop a little bit more. For me personally, I usually shoot on flat because I'm gonna go and edit my footage later, or natural if I want a little bit better out of the camera with less editing. Raw audio has to do with the audio options on the camera. And I would recommend leaving your raw audio off until you get into more advanced things like using external microphones and things like that. Basically what that's gonna do is it's gonna process your audio and give you a second audio track with processed audio. And I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you're a more advanced user. For me personally, I leave it off in preference of just using an external microphone, but it's definitely a way to get a more processed audio file out of your camera. Finally, we have wind reduction. I'm gonna leave this one on auto. We also have an option for on or off. What this does is it tries to reduce that noise when you're recording audio. It helps, it's not great. What's better is something like a dead cat is what it's called, which is a little fuzzy like this. Here, I'll hold it up so you guys can see. A little fuzzy, let me hide behind the camera. Come on camera, refocus, there we go. A little fuzzy thing like that. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, you guys. Technically, a dead cat looks more like this. It's like, well, I mean, I guess it's, I guess it's kind of funny you go on B&H and, and you look it up and I've been noticing they've been calling them wombats now. Um, the other term that they use for is the wind jammer. And usually this sort of thing is a sock that fits over a blimp cage that you'd put a shotgun mic in. Whereas this guy here, that, is just a foam wind screen, okay? So it's not technically what one would call a dead cat screen, okay? And even this mic here has a foam, oops, has a foam wind screen as well, you can see. So the difference being that the foam wind screen, put this back on the mic, the foam windscreen is really designed for kind of like light wind, whereas when you're breaking out the, the wombat or the dead cat, this would be for like 
higher wind. It's, it's helping to dissipate some of that wind more. So anyhow, just wanted to clear that up. Those cut down on wind a lot more, but the camera can do it digitally or try to do it digitally. I'm usually gonna leave this off because again, I'm using an external microphone in most situations. And so this doesn't really affect me because I'm gonna have a nice fuzzy dead cat on that external microphone. Again, if you are a basic shooter, you want the best out of your camera without a lot of editing, without a lot of work, I would put this on on or auto and let it choose which option it wants to use. Finally, we have an option for the media mod, which again is gonna be a future video. This right here is the media mod with the light mod on top of it. Let me hide myself so it focuses, there we go. We're gonna make a video on this specifically and how to go into the preferences and set it up. Woo, woo. We did it everybody, that's awesome. That is how we set up our GoPro. So a couple recommendations for you all. I think the most important things that we've talked about so far are first, formatting your memory cards, really important. Second thing is fully understanding resolution and frame rate and when to use different ones for different situations. Third, if you really wanna unlock the true potential of your GoPro, I think adding something like neutral density filters and manually adjusting your ISO and your shutter speed can be a great way to do it. Truth be told, I never go anywhere without my GoPro NDs, if I have my GoPro with me. Obviously, if I'm going without my GoPro, I don't bring my NDs with me everywhere, but if I'm bringing my GoPro, I'm bringing my NDs. I'm also bringing an external microphone, which we'll have videos on in the future. Basically, there's a lot of ways to build out these cameras and make them have more capabilities. The final thing I'm gonna say is I'm gonna have a video coming out pretty soon that's gonna be my thoughts and opinions on the Hero 10. I wanted to use it a little bit longer before I did that. This video is relatively easy to make because again it sets up very similarly to the other cameras. The final thing I want to say is you can save your different settings as different presets. So if you want to set up a preset with a higher frame rate and a lower resolution and one with a higher resolution and a lower frame rate, that's what these presets are for. So I can go back here. You guys can see we have standard, they call one activity, they call one cinematic, but you can also create new presets and you can say what mode you want them, you can set all of your settings, your everything, all your ProTune stuff, all of that, and you can build presets for specific things you shoot. So me personally on my GoPro, I have a high resolution, low frame rate, and a low resolution, high frame rate preset set up for me for different things that I do. Each preset has something different. I also have presets set up for using ND filters, one for not using ND filters. They're very customizable. Lastly, when you are setting up a preset, you can choose these shortcuts. You can have four shortcuts, which are quick buttons. Let me go back here. Quick buttons on the camera screen to four of your different options. You can see here's one of them. Here's another one that that's for hyper smooth. Here's one for zooming. Here's one for the lens. And here's another one for digital zoom. And we can pick all those. We can customize what those four presets are for each of our different modes. So I highly recommend setting up some different modes, setting up some different shortcuts for those modes. But before I do any of that, I would use the camera and learn what works for you. All right, useful videos are down in the description. I'm gonna have a review coming soon, videos on the different mods coming soon. All of that will be coming down the line, so definitely hit the subscribe button if you liked this video and got some content out of it and enjoyed it. If you guys have a question or comment, leave it in the comment section down below. Hit the like button because it really helps this channel grow and helps our videos reach more audiences. I will see you guys in the next one. Our channel has tons of great educational content, so you guys should definitely check it out. I'll see you all later. Thank you.